This is All India Radio. Power of Listening. Under this series, tonight we take you on a journey to the world of yet another magnificent facet of traditional Indian knowledge systems. I'm Manoj Mainkar. In today's episode, we shall be focusing on the ancient Indian knowledge on animal husbandry from pre-Vedic times to the Ashoka period. The expert on the show is Dr. Aruna T. Kumar, Indologist, Writer and former Chief Editor, Directorate of Knowledge Management in Agriculture, Indian Council of Agricultural Research, New Delhi. Talking to her is Neha Tripathi, Science Communicator and Writer. Stay tuned. Namaskar. In this episode of Power of Listening, we will talk about the ancient knowledge on animal husbandry, the branch of agriculture that focuses upon the proper feeding, shelter, health and breeding of the domestic animals. Keeping livestock is a centuries-old tradition of ancient India. Indian literature is a rich repository of knowledge relating to all aspects of animal husbandry. In ancient India, Animal husbandry was the basis of people's livelihood, socio-economic status and happiness. Thus, importance of the knowledge in this field can be readily realized. We are here for in-depth discussion on the topic with a special guest in studio, Dr. Aruna T. Kumar. Dr. Aruna, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. What is the most important aspect of animal husbandry since then till now? Animal husbandry has been the backbone of agriculture because um, animals are uh, used for draft purpose, mm-hmm. traction, rural transport, then manure and fuel, then wool, hair, hides, skins, which we are supplying to our manufacturing sectors all through the times. We always needed wool or the skin for uh, saving human population from winters. And in present context, you can say they provide enormous employment potential because livestock rearing is highly labor intensive activity and they provide high protein in the form of milk, milk products, meat and eggs. The most important aspect of livestock sector is that it has been going faster than the crop subsector. And given a higher concentration of livestock among the poor smallholders, its contribution to poverty reduction is expected to be significant. It can really remove the poverty. When we talk about animal husbandry, Arunaji, there are four types basically. Rearing of cows and buffaloes for their milk, raising fowls for their eggs and meat, capturing and culturing of fish and beekeeping for their honey and wax. There is a very old Sanskrit saying, Gatanu Gatiko Loko, without thinking, one follows another. Sometimes I feel that the world over, the sheep footprint followed by civilizations. Human being just followed the sheep going from one greener pasture to another greener pasture. And that developed the civilization across the globe. And first, Sheep was used for ghee. Uh, it was a sheep ghee that was used, oh. not the cow ghee that much. Okay. It was sheep ghee. And then rearing of cows and buffaloes for milk. In fowls, I will tell you some interesting thing okay. that sure. uh, our uh, this red jungle fowl is the father of the world poultry. Poultry is spread from India, hmm. from red jungle fowl. It is found in the ancient times also. We were using it for meat and eggs and now we are having designer eggs. Whatever type of nutrition we want, what type of vitamins, amino acids we want, we feed those things to our poultry Hmm. so that they can give us the designer eggs. And capturing of fishes, it was a very uh, important occupation in those days also. Beekeeping, it was wild and uh, Cattle was mainly used for draft and dairy products and there, then there were horses, elephants, camel. These were for draft or war purposes. They were keeping them and they were rearing them and these were domesticated. Goat was there. Goat is very important in the whole ecosystem and it has been. Goat, sheep, cattle, these have been very important animals of our civilizations. 
as you mentioned that these have been very important but these are a number of different types of animals that we are discussing here mentions are there even in our vedas one of the hymn says may we escape poverty by means of cattle and acceleration in demand of livestock products is expected to improve the income of people involved in the livestock sector as well this clearly indicated uh, the cattle heads in the family the number of cattle a family has at that time how do you see this and what more references you see in our ancient literature in the uh, rigveda as also in the athar veda mm-hmm. we find references to the usefulness of uh, cattle in cultivation in irrigation uh because drawing the water from the wells which apparently were used mainly for irrigation purposes the satpata brahmana and other literature of the post vedic era also indicate that the indo aryans realized very well the importance of the operations of animal husbandry there are some references to the ancient indian agriculture in panini's grammar also and mangsthnis who came during maurya period he said even at the time of war the combatants used to leave those engaged in husbandry quite unmolested so you can imagine the importance that were attached to the people and the livestock during those periods of course uh, these things were so much popular around that era as well but there were some methods that were used around that time and uh, some of the methods that are being used today that did we derive anything from them or is it completely different the methods that has been used in animal husbandry animal husbandry as a whole is literally the same mm-hmm. but we are using the modern methods of course i will give you one example when yudhishthir became the um, samrat narad came to him mm-hmm. and uh, narad asked him questions related to every aspect of uh, the governance every aspect from spy to uh, diplomats to agriculture and everything and in that he asks one question about animal husbandry mm-hmm. and that is do we have good bulls for our cattle and this is still the situation okay male cattle still has the real role in improving the genetics of uh, cattle and okay. then there is feed and fodder supply because if feed and fodder is not proper then the animals can't survive and imagine india has animals in minus 50 degree centigrade that is uh pashmina and changthangi goat in ladakh and all that area mm-hmm. and nubra valley our double humped camels to plus 50 degree centigrade in rajasthan marwari yes so minus 50 to plus 50 we are having domesticated animals we are feeding them and we are taking produce from them so you can imagine the spectrum and the knowledge that india has for the globe that's true Yes. very true and when you we are talking about such temperature difference such huge temperature difference one of the primary concern for anyone who is you know uh, having this uh, these animals taming them or domesticating them is the housing or shelter for them when was the first time this housing concept came into effect from the very beginning because mm-hmm. domesticated animals were to be kept at home within a uh, hygienic conditions yes and uh, each eco region requires a different housing in our ancient literature the mention is of uh, one who makes a cattle shed strong and keeps it clean from dung secures healthy growth of animals another is goat should never be kept in a cow shed hmm. reason is the hygiene goat needs more hygiene okay there can be cross infection also yes. so to avoid all that thing cow house uh, should be frequently fumigated with uh, powder of deodar east facing animal house shed provides maximum comfort and you can see verified by the modern literature also modern mm-hmm. scientific methods also the kacha floor is better for the small calves because they won't slip on that yes so all these things are there and the most important thing is the micro environment of the house specific trees are grown so that uh, the micro environment of the houses are good and that helps in improving the productivity 
जी दैट्स करेक्ट दैट हाउसिंग इज डिफरेंट फॉर डिफरेंट एग्रो इकोलॉजिकल रीजन एज वेल एज यू नो लोकली अवेलेबल लो कॉस्ट हाउसिंग मटीरियल Now we all understand that every animal has different nutritional requirements. Even these days, if we have a cow or a horse or a dog at home or in our farm, we need to consider its preferences, body needs, nutritional aspects. Hmm. Cotillia's Earth Shastra refers that all cattle shall be supplied with abundance of fodder and water. Mm-hmm. Similarly, there are several verses in Rig Veda sh- which show that uh, good pastures were used in those days for grazing cows and calves. and emphasis was also put on use of pure water so how ancient people knew what to feed to their respective cattle in those days those early days in those early days they developed the guidelines in the field of animal nutrition like green grasses and water were considered most nourishing food for cattle for the increase of milk yield and barley was the other food for cattle as per the rig veda The other crop described in Rig Veda as fodder for animals is sugarcane and this has been uh, again verified by our modern literature that sugarcane is one of the most important fodder mm-hmm. leftovers of sesame that is til Ji. after extraction of oil were also used as feed when animals are confined to home then they are given this uh, oil cakes etc atharva veda saying I offer you dried sugar cane, white sea same, reeds and bamboos. Whatever improved the product, the productivity was used. Hmm. It has been mentioned in Ashva Ayurveda that cattle should graze freely so that they achieve a successful mating and their further breeding. So in those days it was green pasture. Kalidas in his uh, Raghuvansham shloka 73 says that a piece of rock salt should always be kept in a stable for horses and this is being practiced even today another very important thing that has been mentioned in arth shastra is common rights in pasture uh, they recognized it and they made it mandatory that all the villages will have common pasture and every family has a right over it this is a very big problem in present days now the common pastures are again being marked in present situation we are working on that that again that there should be common pastures in the villages nobody should encroach them mm-hmm. those encroachments are being removed the laws are being made to have the common pastures in the villages because these are very important for animal health Uh, Aruna ji with all your citations and mentions Aruna ji we already know that animal husbandry was in much advanced stage in ancient India there were specialists for animals and sometimes only for one species of animals that's what i want to understand because they also need to be you know taken care of their health some kind of disease or any kind of ailment any accident or anything like that so was there any uh, specialists or any special treatment thought around that time Yes uh, veterinary practices developed in west only after the 10th century mm-hmm. but described in ayurveda for over 2000 years limitation of modern drug system is there mm-hmm. technology is very high cost frequent emergence of drug resistance that we are transferring to the human being also because if my cow is being treated for tuberculosis medicine and she is resistant to it the she will pass on the resistance to the human being consuming the milk i will not use such uh, strong words but certainly it will okay. and then the meat products all over the world there are uh, questions about uh, the uh, antibiotic resistance in feeding they were giving the antibiotics to the uh, poultry and all that now they are checking that and they want to give the herbal ingredients to stop this resistance and all these things the era of treating ethno veterinary medicine and any other ethno knowledge system with suspicion and labeling it as myth superstition and mythology or witchcraft is gone it's called alternative medicine and okay. it's a trillion dollar economy and uh, we the owners of this knowledge should exploit it to the fullest and there is a country like uh, mongolia or manchuria where 70% 80% people are depending on on livestock 
and they depend on uh, alternative medicines and india can provide <laughs> we we stand nowhere at present we are increasing our role but we have to increase and uh, traditional knowledge is there traditional information is there there are medicines we have that very specific information about which herb can treat this thing this herb can treat this thing like um, curcum longa sesamum indicum for expulsion of uh, a retained placenta uh, muria coenge for promoting fertility in cattle zizifus pneumolaria to treat prolapsed if uh, cow has developed any of these problems it, it may go barren hmm so by feeding these things we can really check these problems and all this was known in the earlier era these yes, medicines the, these are come? charak samhita okay. charak samhita uh, describes 1500 plants identifying 350 as valuable medicines of the 45000 recognized india flowering and non flowering plants 2000 are mentioned frequently in literature for medicinal value and 750 are at present being utilized of course there are references of veterinary science in charak samhita chapter 2 verse 10 to 26 even sushruta and harit samhita have chapters devoted on care of animals one verse of an atharvedic haim indicates uh, that ancient indians recognized the ability of animals to distinguish medicinal plants now how animals can differentiate medicinal plants and what was the use of their ex- such expertise uh, the the hum goes like this well does the wild boar know a plant the mongoose knows the healing herb plants are known to the silvian beasts because they are in the forest they know which plant they can eat at what time it is their sensitivity towards that they observe and eat observing them eating those plants uh, the men also took notice of those herbs and all those mm-hmm. things and then adopted them our rishis and our yogis who were sitting in the ashram they were observing the nature and taking those observations they tested those observations and then they finalized the thing so it is science uh, it's not something has been told to them in their wild dreams mm-hmm. uh, you might have heard that uh, birds taking sand bath birds taking sand bath it means it will rain it, it's not something a myth kind of thing it's, it's not, not a myth because a bird is feeling the moisture in the in the wings okay and to dry it up it's taking bath in the sand so it means the enough moisture is there hmm. and the bird knows how the, to manage it how to manage it it is observation ancient indians recognized that animals could distinguish medicinal plants and our ancient evidences literary and otherwise help ascertaining the animal husbandry methods the behavior of animals was being studied mm-hmm. for the benefit of human being but they observe they noted res- down they have noted down they have given us that and they acted on those things yes so just like these uh, animals are smart enough to understand the medicinal plants and give us those clues which we used and we have noted and we have used, uh, we have been you know acting upon it similarly how emergency care was given to these animals around that time and uh, any kind of surgical in- instruments were also used for treatment of animals veterinary surgery was in vogue mm-hmm. at that time there were uh, several uh, surgical tools which were used and there is a uh, very clear cut uh, instructions that how to use them like setting of bones was being done castration of horses was being done yoke bulls and rams was common there is a description in atharveda of a horse suffering from lamps and an operation upon the swelling was then performed with a splinter so that means the splinter was there uh, yeah the and uh, the herdsman they had knowledge of anatomy knew the details of the medicinal plants marked the animals under him so that he can identify that this is my animal this belongs to me the numbering was done and kept them healthy this was his duty 
and it was his duty to choose the pasture to milk the cow and leave the milk in the udder for the calf so every aspect was taken care of nothing was left to imagination uh, there is also mention of the great king ashoka uh, it is said that he brought the first known veterinary hospitals to th- of the world he arranged uh, cultivation of herbal medicines for men and animals in his empire and adjoining kingdoms Uh, Ashoka even founded hospitals and dispensaries for man and animals throughout his kingdoms. Similarly, is there anything in the Mauryan dynasty as well, or in the Buddhist era as well? Buddhist jatakas mm-hmm. uh, have detailed information on ethics of treating animals. Okay, there were stern punishments for over exploitation of animals. Even animal work hours were decided. Anyone found poisoning the water source for animals was harshly punished. In post-Vedic times, a decided advance in veterinary uh, knowledge took place, and state departments of livestock were formed. Veterinary officers were appointed to provide them with the knowledge. Veterinary science was actually included in the medical schools of that period. Charak Samhita has description of medical students sitting around Atreya Rishi and asking questions related to animal uh, diseases. Mm-hmm. Kautilya. in his arthashastra gives a detailed and vivid review of the livestock department under chandragupta maurya and uh, ashoka in 273 to 232 bc founded hospitals and dispensaries all over his kingdom for animals so it was a big advancement of as per the modern thoughts yes yeah, so have we carried anything till date do you see any uh, such references which ever were given in these charak samhita or in the ashoka reign and everywhere uh, are they being brought today as well and being practiced yes there are many uh, medicines uh, like munja grass is uh, used for dysentery arundhati has healing proportion in case of wounds mm-hmm. make the cow pen rich in milk atharveda tells water is constantly addressed as the most excellent of remedies better healer than physician the gynecological detail gynecological problems the brucella disease which is very common at present has been discussed in those times also yes arna ji i w- also want to bring into the concept of you know uh, domesticating cows cows have always been sacred for us and what special mention you see about cows in our ancient literature along with other animals in the rigveda cow has been called aghanya not to be killed in yajurveda also cow has been given the status of mother mm-hmm. go matra no vidyati mother cow is beyond comparison the importance of cow as an asset has also been cited in atharveda dhenua sadanam rainam cow is the mine of prosperity i would like to tell a story here uh, that's modern times a story of a tractor a tractor was bought in a village and the tractor man Uh, did the plowing for all the farmers farmers stopped keeping the bulls mm-hmm. the number of cows decreased the excreta that was going into the pond and making the feed for the fish stopped and so they died there was no use of a pond so they filled the pond also there was no bullocks there were no cows only tractor was left i have nothing against tractor mm. but there was a research in pandnagar university which tells us that we don't have enough diesel enough iron to make those number of tractors which can replace all the draft animals of india so we have to have our draft animals uh as you said uh, referred to pandnagar university and there are so many researches going on all over india uh, there is a lot of research being done on this topic of animal husbandry as well people like you are digging deep into our ancient literature to bring forward the citations and help us know our ancient knowledge so how you retrieve this valuable information how is it available and how to dig into it if you can just let us know neha ji jin khoja tin paiya gehre pani pat all the information 
has vanished from the public domain mm-hmm. and icr has been doing a very good job since 1930s they are working on ancient indian agriculture there have been projects there have been a uh, documentation it is available mm-hmm. with icar then uh, recently uh, that is in 90s they had this indigenous technical knowledge project and all over india they collected the indian traditional knowledge they verified it and they have the documentation also so all that information is available but in printed form and how do you see the importance of these traditional knowledge in modern animal husbandry today scenario professionals from fields have recognized valued documented ethnocentrically studied the potential effectiveness of all these things there has been a holistic evaluation of the traditional and non traditional knowledge so we now know that our ancient literature is full of references on different aspects of animal husbandry hmm. care of animals was of paramount importance in ancient india animal husbandry laws were very scientific since hmm. those times yeah that's all for today we had with us in studio dr arna t kumar ji Thank you so much Aruna ji for your time and valuable inputs. Thank you very much Neha ji and it was really uh, very interesting to share this information with you. Same here. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar. Animal husbandry in ancient India. You heard the 31st episode of our all new series on traditional Indian knowledge systems. Power of listening. The expert on the show was Dr. Aruna T. Kumar, Indologist, writer, and former chief editor, Directorate of Knowledge Management in Agriculture, Indian Council of Agricultural Research, New Delhi. Talking to her was Neha Tripathi, science communicator and writer. We hope you enjoyed it. The series has been conceptualized by Shashi Shekhar Vempati, CEO Prasar Bharati. and produced by Vinod Kumar special thanks to Amol Parth and Randeep Thakur for their contributions this episode is also available on our official youtube channel akashvani air be there on the 6th of may same time same frequencies this is manoj mainkar signing off from delhi bye for now <laughs>